Assalamu alaikum students. This is third lecture in Pakistan studies. The title of the lecture is Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan and the Aligarh Movement. In this lecture, we will focus on the efforts of Sir Sayyid and his colleagues based primarily in Aligarh for educational and cultural uplift and regeneration of the Muslims of British India. The discussion of these issues will be spread over two lectures. That is this lecture, which is lecture number three, and lecture number four, we would be covering different aspects about the role of Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan and his colleagues. The kind of contribution they made towards educational, social and cultural uplift and what kind of strategies and methods they suggested for the revival and regeneration of Muslims after 1857. In this connection, we will be discussing six broad themes. First, we'll talk about background. What was the context in which Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan and his colleagues were working? Two, what kind of effort did they make, that is, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan is, and his colleagues, towards promotion of understanding between the Muslims and the British? What were the methods they adopted for removal of biases which had developed in both communities, that is Muslim and the British, who had become rulers by that time. Third, encouragement to Muslims to learn modern knowledge and English language. Four, educational movement based essentially and primarily in the city of Aligarh. Five, avoidance of active role in politics of that time. Sixth, we'll talk about the contribution and impact of Aligarh movement on Muslims of this region and how that contributed ultimately to the establishment of Pakistan. Let's first take up the background, the context in which Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan and his colleagues were functioning. As a background, we have to understand that after 1857, Muslims were passing through a very difficult period, a period of degeneration and decay. But the roots of this decay can be traced back to the earlier period. In fact, the decay of the Muslims started with the degeneration of the Mughal Empire. And in that context, Europeans started coming to India, the British being last of them, and ultimately they controlled most of India. It was in the beginning of the 17th century that is 1608, that the first British ship 
belonging to East India Company, led by Captain Hawkins, landed on the western coast of India. Surat was the name of the place. The objective was to start a trade to and from India. When the first batch of the British traders landed as the representatives of East India Company, they had to compete with other Europeans who were there in the region. Then in 1913, Captain Hawkins and others who succeeded him were able to get a formal permission for starting trade from there from Mughal Emperor Jahangir. And in this way, they became a group regularly trading from here. But ultimately, it is they who were able to establish their rule. East India Company ruled India until 1858. And from 1858, the British crown directly ruled India. The policies of the East India Company were discriminatory towards Muslims. And after the British crown took over India, that is, it replaced East India Company in 1858, there was more discrimination towards Muslims. In fact, there was hostility because the British thought that the Muslims were mainly responsible for the uprising that took place against the British colonial authority in 1857. After this incident, they adopted a deliberate policy of discrimination towards the Muslims. It was in this context that Sir Sayyid and some of his colleagues came forward to enable the Muslims to deal with the situation. Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan was born in Delhi in 1817, his family served the Mughals and then East India Company. When he entered practical life, he also joined the service of East India Company and was posted first at Agra and ultimately transferred to Aligarh, from where he started his movement and his efforts to change the conditions of Muslims. Sir Sayyid's basic argument was that instead of living in the past, instead of thinking about the past glory, the Muslims of India should recognize the reality of the time. They should accept the changed conditions and circumstances. The condition was that the British had established themselves in India and the Muslims will have to deal with these people, that is, who are the government uh, now. He thought that the Muslims must have modern education. They should learn English and equip themselves with the change condition. What he was talking about was self-improvement. Muslims 
should improve themselves to deal with the situation. A, a proposal for internal change amongst the Muslims, a change of attitude, a change of disposition, that is what he was talking about. And the important thing in this connection from his point of view was that the pattern of relationship that has developed between the Muslims and the British has to be changed. Changed in a manner that Muslims do not suffer. And in order to achieve this objective, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan took a number of steps, adopted a number of measures to promote understanding between the British and the Muslims. The first effort was made by Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan for promotion of understanding was the publication of a booklet or a pamphlet entitled Rasalae Asbabe Bhagavate Hind. This was a factual statement of the causes of Indian mutiny as it was known at that time by the British. This booklet was translated in English by Sir Sayyid's friends because the objective was that the British should read it because this study not only talked about the Muslims, their problems, but also the policies of the British that had led to this unfortunate development of 1857. This is such an important document that even up to now the text of this document that is Rasalae Asbab e Bagawat e Hind is available in the document on pre-independence history of Pakistan. In this booklet, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan identifies the causes that led to the uprising in 1857 and gives examples to prove his point. So it's not merely presentation of causes, but there is enough evidence which he has pulled together to substantiate his case. He identified several causes and we can mention a few of these here. First important cause mentioned by Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan was a general lack understanding that the British wanted to convert the people of India to Christianity and he gives examples why this perception developed in India to show that some of the policy decisions were responsible for that. Second, many laws which the British Indian government adopted did not suit the needs and requirements of the people of this land. And the government never bothered about that. Third factor which he talks about is the lack of communication between the ruler and the ruled. He argued that 
the British and their government in India was not able to communicate the objectives and intentions of the law and different administrative measures to the people of India. In the same way, there were no arrangements whereby the Indians could let the administration know their reaction to the policies the government had adopted. So there was a lack of communication, which in Sir Sayyid's view was mainly responsible for the situation that developed there. Then he also talks about number of other factors like mismanagement of the army affairs. The government was not really sensitive about the sensitivities of soldiers regarding many things. And he gives examples to prove that point. One point mentioned by him was common cooking facilities for all kind of Indian soldiers, Muslims, Hindus, various castes among Hindus and common cooking facilities were a cause of irritation. And he identified several other reasons for that. So in a way, this book was able to identify the factors. And this was widely read because its English translation was available. The British read it. And one important consequence of this publication was that when the British government announced the Government of India Act 1861, it provided for representation of the Indians in the administration. So in a way, the principle of representation at a very limited scale was introduced in 1861 in administration, British administration. And this was one consequence of what Sir Sayyid had emphasized, the issue of lack of communication. In addition to this, he also wrote number of other things in order to remove distrust between the Indians and the British and also to remove biases against Muslims. One series of publication was Loyal Mohammedans of India. At that time, the term Mohammedans was used by the British for Muslims. And Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan has used the same word Mohammedans in order to communicate with the British. The idea of publication of this series was to show to the British that the Muslims were not inherently opposed to the British. In this series, he identified the contribution the Muslims made towards helping the British or saving British life during the 1857 uprising. He also emphasized that the uprising of 1857 was not a jihad, but 
an expression and manifestation of the grievances, complaints, and misunderstandings that had developed at that time, which he had identified in the earlier work, Rasalae Asbabe Bhagavate Hind. In addition to these publications, he also did lot of other things in the form of publications. Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan brought out several publications to dispel a idea or a misperception that there is an inherent conflict between Islam and Christianity. His argument was that this is not the case. So the first thing which he published was a commentary on Bible. In this commentary, he tried to identify the commonalities, the shared points between Islam and Christianity, showing that both have certain things in common. Both are different religious systems, but they also share certain things. Another publication was Tehkike Lavze Nasara. Nasara was the word Nasara was being used at that time for Christians. He argued in this publication that the use of word Nasara does not mean that Muslims are showing some contempt towards Christians or they view them in negative term, but it is a positive word and they are expressing positive sentiment. The interpretation given by the Europeans, by the British and some missionary is not what is reality. So this was also an effort to remove misunderstandings that were developing between the Christians and the Muslims of that time. Another publication was Ahkame Tawam El Al Kitab. That means what are the principles, what are the injections for eating with the people who follow any book of God, in this case Bible. And Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan argued that Muslims and Christians can eat together because both are Ahlul Kitab. Therefore, the Muslims and Christians could interact more smoothly and they could work together harmoniously. Another publication was a rebuttal to the book written by William Muir on the life of the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. That author had made some critical comments and Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan wrote a rebuttal outlining the, uh, the deficiencies in that publication. In other words, while trying to promote understanding 
and uh, goodwill between the two communities, he was also prepared to defend what was right in Islam. And another important publication by Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan was a review or commentary on W. W. Hunter's book, The Indian Musliman. This is an important book because this book outlines the difficult situation the Muslims were in after 1857. But there were some inaccuracies in this book and Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan took upon himself to remove some of those misunderstandings and some of the points about Muslims which Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan thought were not correct. So this was also an important effort on his part to remove misperceptions, misunderstanding and misinterpretation of Muslims in this region. In addition to working for promotion of understanding between Muslims and Christians or you could say between Muslims and the British because British were the rulers at that time, he also focused on Muslims, what Muslims should do. As I said in the beginning, that one part of his effort was that Muslims should also accept the changed conditions and changed circumstances. They should also rise to meet the challenges of the changed time. In order to achieve that objective, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan emphasized that Muslims must acquire modern knowledge and they should learn English language language of the rulers. In 1869 and 70, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan went to England with his son and spent several months there. During his stay in England, he visited different universities especially the famous Oxford University, Cambridge University and other education institution. The objective was to understand their education system and also to see to it what can he learn from there for introducing in India. He was impressed by education, by quest for knowledge and technological advancement initiative that was quite apparent at that time in the UK. He returned to India towards the end of 1870 and when he returned to India he focused on improvement of education and how Muslims could acquire western knowledge and learn English so that Muslims have the requisite qualifications, have the capability, have the ability 
to deal with the situation. In order to promote modern knowledge and English, he established a scientific society. This society used to hold meetings from time to time where concerned people would come and discuss affairs. But this society also saw to it that good articles in English are translated into Urdu and published so that those people who don't know English can also learn. In fact, at that time, only a limited number of Muslims had sufficient knowledge of English. Not many Muslims at that time knew enough English to benefit from articles in that language. Therefore, translation was very important to transfer knowledge from English to Urdu. Another important venture undertaken by Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan was the publication of Aligarh Institute Gazette. This gazette was published in English as well as in Urdu and published important articles, articles which Sir Sayyid and his colleagues thought must be circulated amongst the Muslims. So Aligarh Institute Gazette played useful role in inculcating modern knowledge and modern ideas amongst the Muslims. Another publication was a magazine, Tehzeebul Ikhlaq, published in Urdu. And this magazine continued to be published for a long time. Tehzeebul Ikhlaq used to focus on social and cultural issues and was publishing unconventional articles in the sense emphasizing Muslims about the problems which they face, about some of their practices, social habits, cultural habits and how to improve these. Therefore, this magazine became very popular amongst those who were interested in reading these things. In addition to these efforts to promote modern ideas, modern knowledge, in India amongst the Muslims, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan devoted directly to promotion of education, what is often described as the education movement. This was launched from Aligarh. The reason why Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan attached importance to this was that he thought the Muslims must have modern education. Unless they go through the educational process whereby they learn modern uh, education, they will not be able to play a role under the administrative and the political system the British colonial authorities had established. And they will be left behind 
they will be lagging and pushed to the periphery of the system unless they equip themselves unless they qualify they will not be able to seek government jobs they will not be able to compete with the other communities therefore in 1872 a decision was made to set up a muslim school system that would give modern education as well as islamic education i may point out here that one major bias amongst muslim regarding the education which the british introduced in india was that their western education was alienating them from islam the british had established universities in india on the lines of the british system of education but only a small number of muslims were going to these modern institutions so sir sayed was very much aware of this problem therefore when he began to work towards establishing educational institution he combined the two types of education modern western knowledge learnings english plus islamic education about islam diniyat and islamic subjects so he was trying to combine the two to do away with that bias to do away with that perception that if you have modern education then you are alienated from islam if you want to have islamic education you can't have western education so the aligarh ed educational movement essentially combined the two and this is what is a major achievement by sir sayed ahmed khan so after deciding in 1872 to set up educational institutions in 1875 that is in june 1875 he and his colleagues started a college at aligarh and two years later in june 1877 this college or you could say this educational project was formally inaugurated and launched by lord lytton the british were supportive of this effort because they thought in this way muslims would have modern education and with the passage of time this college called mohammedan anglo oriental college m a o college aligarh became a focal point where muslims came from different parts of india for getting modern education what were the features qualities of this college one as i have already mentioned that sir sayed's college at aligarh mao college at aligarh was combining the two types of education when the muslims were getting modern western education they were learning english but they were also learning islam they were having islamic uh, education so that the product of this college when goes out in the field he has the modern knowledge 
but he is not delinked from his roots that is islam islamic identity islamic heritage and islamic culture the second attribute or characteristic feature of this college was that it was a residential college students were living on the campus and the college authorities sir sayed and his colleagues were paying attention to the lives of the students 24 hours not merely during the college working hour but even uh, later on third the staff the teachers included the british as well as indian so they had british teachers they had indian um, indian uh, teacher the most significant feature of this education system which most of us do not know is that the college right from the early years also had non muslim students it was not 100% muslim student body although there were more muslims but some non muslims some hindus were also studying at the aligarh college the non muslims were not obliged to study islamic studies or diniyat that rule applied only to the muslim students and non muslims were not asked to do that so that point has to be recognized that the college at aligarh had this arrangement that there were non muslims present who were also getting education like any other students the general disposition of the college was loyalty to the british not encouraging ideas that would promote discord or conflict with the british with the passage of time this college developed into a bigger institution because the contributions were coming from muslims and the british government was also helping to strengthen this institution sir sayed ahmed khan wanted this college to become a university this did not happen during his lifetime sir sayed ahmed khan died in 1898 2 years before the turn of the century and his dream that this college should become a university did not materialize however in 1920 this college was given the status of a university by the british indian government and this was known as muslim university aligarh and this university is still functioning in india now the problem with this college educational college was that it was located in one place that is aligarh sir sayed and his colleague wanted that the message of aligarh should spread all over india and they should focus on muslim education 
all over India. And he also wanted that Muslims from different parts of uh, India should be encouraged to come together to discuss the problems which the Muslims are facing. Therefore, an organization called Mohammedan Educational Conference was set up. Mohammedan Educational Conference was an organization which used to hold its meetings in different parts of India. Muslims would come there and they would discuss the issue. An important goal of Mohammedan Educational Conference was to think together, to pool their resources for improving education amongst Muslims. Another goal was how to improve the madrasa education, that is the traditional Islamic education, because they were not ignoring that too. And how to encourage Muslims to establish similar institutions elsewhere. The declared purpose of Mohammedan Educational Conference was to promote the cause of education. But actually, Mohammedan Educational Conference became a very important forum for the Muslims before the Muslim League was established in 1906. In this conference, they would discuss, in addition to education, other issues of significance and importance for Muslims, trade, agriculture, and related issues. Dear students, in this first lecture on Sir Sayyid and his contribution, we have discuss the conditions and circumstances in which Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan and his spirited and dedicated colleagues began their work. We also identified the goals and objectives which they had in their mind and the strategies which they adopted. And in the next lecture, which will be the second lecture on Sir Sayyid, we will discuss related issues. Thank you and Khuda Hafiz until we meet again.